Hello and welcome to Commodity Champions. I'm Anisha Gupta. And the yellow metal gets costlier as prices hover near an eight-month highs on the back of a weak dollar. The prices have also received a boost from increased demand from China. Gold has outperformed most of the other asset classes as it has surged by 3% so far in the new year itself. With less than a month to go for the union budget 2023-24, the jewellery industry has put forth its wish list. The diamonds and gemstone industry is seeking a reduction in imports duty from 5 to 2.5%. Meanwhile, the precious metal industry, which includes gold, silver and platinum, wants import duty to be reduced to 4%. The industry also wants basic custom duty on jewellery to be hiked to 25%. To speak more about the budget wish list, Bipul Shah, chairman at the Gem and Jewelry Export Promotion Council, is now here with us at CNBC TV 18. Mr. Shah, hi, thank you so much for joining us. You know, starting with the budget wish list itself, and we are barely 15 days away from that, and there is just so much that the industry needs, requires, and wishes for as well. Starting with the import duty itself, and I do understand that we are not at a very competitive place where we stand with 15 to 18% more duty than what Dubai also does. How much do you think the government would be ready to roll this back? Uh, good afternoon, Manisha. Nice talking to you. As far as the duties on the precious metals, which is gold and silver, is concerned, we have been pushing it for a long time to bring it down to 4%. That could be competitive for exports and good for the country. But uh, somehow, this request every year, which we are keeping, and we are always hopeful that government will look into it. As we do, we don't want un, uh, uh, we don't want uh, the under uh, illegal channels to uh, come into the industry and uh, uh, play the foul game. So our government is we are trying to make sure that the government brings down the duty to four percent to, to, to discourage the smuggling uh, activities which takes place. Mm. Mr. Shah, that pretty is, uh, that's pretty much evident, wouldn't you see? Because uh, uh, if you look at the spot markets in India right now, the gold is trading at around 28 to 30 dollars at discount. Would you say that is uh, that is one of the other reason that we have seen higher import duty create? Um, not really as such, because it is uh, gold again is being followed as, as far as the international markets are concerned, and again with the rising interest costs, and also gold is an inflation hedge. So gold as now China coming out of COVID also. So it's looking uh, 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 and it's a big consumer of uh, uh, gold. So personally, I feel gold in dollar terms also is looking very, very bullish. So that is also taking the price to the skyrockets. Mm. What's your sense about diamonds and lab-grown diamonds? I mean, that's the new kid on the block. What is this sector looking forward to from budget? Yes, this sector looks very, very promising and uh, we've been very encouraged. And uh, uh, as far as lab grown diamonds are concerned, from like uh, we are having almost uh, 3,000 to 3,500 semiconductor, I means uh, 3,500 CBD machines already uh, in India. And we have many more in uh, many more in progress. And uh, that's a technology which has been very well adapted by our people over here. And very soon, uh, this uh, industry in, uh, means from mere one billion dollar, we look to see it going to almost five to six billion dollars in the next four or five years. And there is a uh, huge uh, uh, means uh, uh, people are uh, looking for this sector as far as the margins are concerned, the profitability is concerned. Only is the question how the acceptability and the marketing has to be done. So this looks very promising, and it is supplementing our industry as well. Hmm. So, Mr. Shah, apart from the duty cuts that you're looking at and the fact that the diamonds need a lot of more push coming in, what else is on the list right now? Currently, see, we are precisely asking for four important major things. We are very much focused. One is very, uh, one is uh, with the, we are, uh, we are having a special notified zone for all the foreign mining companies who are coming here and they are able to show, uh, view the goods over here. But unfortunately, they do not, they are, don't, they cannot sell the goods because of the complex tax system. So after the viewing, the goods go back to UAE, Belgium, and again re imports into India. So what we are in talks with the government that if this could be looked into a presumptive tax for these foreign mining companies, if at least that could be competitive to Dubai and Belgium, so that will encourage. And as it is, India consumes the mega, mega consumes and uh, uh, cut and polish the uh, rough diamonds over here. Hmm. So that will be a really a, a good booster. Okay. So government is uh, looking into it, and I'm hopeful that on this budget at least 
there should be there should be some kind of announcement as far as special notified zone sales to sales can proceed with some kind of relaxation to all these foreign mining companies okay well that aside uh, you know you've just come back from IGS as well and the industry has started to look at that as a barometer on what can be sense seen in sense of demand and uh, business overall going forward what has been your takeaway from the latest one Yes, I can tell you that this was one of the very good show in the beginning of the new year, and it was very uh, promising. And we spoke to all of the exhibitors. It was one of the largest IHS signature show, which took place more than 2,300 exhibitors and more than 3,500 booths. So I mean, uh, and the, 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 it was spreaded on five days. And uh, overall, when I'm speaking to all the exhibitors, mm -hmm. they were, uh, I mean, they were very happy, and they were uh, the opportunity. I mean, uh, they are looking forward. And uh, yes, only thing is that. Gold uh, prices, which are going high, so that is a concern. We need some kind of stability. So yes, we are crossing our fingers, and it could be a good season for us coming ahead. Mm. Well, as you mentioned, there, the, you know, the gold prices have been on a higher side, and the jewelry demand clearly seems to have taken a bit of a hit because of that. The month of December hasn't been so great. January hasn't started so well as well for the jewelry as a sector, and that can be seen as per the latest data that you have put out in sense of exports, where the quarter on quarter seems fine, but the month of December definitely doesn't. What do you think will need for a push when it comes to exports as well? Yes, uh, this is where you are rightly said. December has been a uh, uh, little, little bit disappointing, and mainly reason is that because of high interest costs going up, uh, interest rise, uh, rising costs. Uh, the retailers are also become very much cautious. They do not want to restock the goods. Uh, they just want to take it uh, one by one. How the store, uh, sales take place, and based on that, they are keeping the orders. So we are seeing orders compared to last December. We are seeing less orders in sheep. Yes, we are hopeful that. We could have a good Valentine season coming forward, and coming forward, and we are hopeful that there will be orders coming in. And uh, 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 this quarter is going to be a challenging quarter for all of us. And we are just crossing our fingers that the target which has been given by our honourable Prime uh, uh, and Commerce Minister, Mr. Piyush Goyalji, 45.7. Hopefully, we should achieve that target. Mm. The other thing that the industry keeps an eye on and the impact of is the FTAs and the latest ones with UAE and Australia. How do you read on that? Yes, that has been a good boost. Sure, this, uh, this is uh, these are the things which is very important, and it is helping the industry. Our gold exports after the CIPA and the, this uh, agreements which has taken place has really boosted our gold exports, gold jewelry exports to UAE and Australia. And I think many more uh, uh, this kind of uh, treaties which is uh, are taking place, which, which we have heard from the honourable uh, commerce minister that uh, very we are very soon we are looking at the Euro uh, uh, EU. We are looking forward for the UK as well as we are looking for the Canada. So hopefully this kind of treaties, if this takes place in 2023, that is going to be a good booster for our sector as such. All right, that's going to be a booster for this year. Uh, you know, uh, how would you look back at 2020? I mean, there were 22. There were all kind of uncertainties there, but gold prices and demand both gave us a positive there. The start to 2023 has been slightly on a weaker side again, as we've been talking on how the gold prices have continued to be uh, on a very bullish note. They they continue to be trading at an eight-month high is there. But looking forward, apart from these uh, trade agreements, how is the overall year looking to you as GJPC? What is going to be your game plan for this year now? Uh, 2023, to be honest, is going to be a challenging year okay. because this is a year where we are going to see rising interest costs. Mm -hmm. People are going to be cautious. People will have to uh, cut down on their costs. We, I mean, that is the area where I mean, so this year is going to be a little bit of uh, means uh, unpredictable. Uh, hopefully, we are just crossing our fingers that it goes well for the gems and jewelry industry. Yes, but yes, on back of my mind, yes, I am a little bit uh, means uh, cautious as far as 2023 is concerned because uh, of a lot of things. Hopefully, this Ukraine Russia also the the war uh, resolved that could also help us to ease on the supply. As well as Chinese uh, uh, new I mean, after the Chinese New Year, how the sales are taking place in China. If the government is uh, injecting a lot of uh, money into the economy, that could help into spending, and that could also result into demand. So that also we are hopeful because US uh, we do not too much of dependence only on one market. Also, it's not good for any sector as such. So we are hopeful that uh, Chinese market also start picking up after the Chinese New Year. Oh, well, absolutely. You are looking for more markets. There were final question, Mr. Shah, and this is, I mean, as you look at 2023 as a challenging year, but we have seen jewelers in India continue to expand, open more stores. There's way more capex now entering into the market. So is there something as an advisory uh, caution note that you have put out to the industry? 
Uh, see, uh, to be honest, the uh, uh, domestic market is doing good. Okay. As far as my job, my, my job is on the export promotion side. And for me, export market is also playing an important role. But you are seeing that a huge consumption in the domestic market. A lot of weddings have taken place. So there is uh, that means there is an upbeat. So overall, things in the domestic market, only the concern is the gold price, which is sh uh, shooting up. And uh, the way it is going, that could uh, affect the demand as such. So yes, uh, overall, People need to be cautious. Inventory levels has to be maintained and uh, uh, wait for right opportunities and ensure if uh, everybody, if there is a proper self-discipline in the industry, things should be looking good for the gems and jewelry sector as a whole. All right. So from budget to exports to prices to business ac uh, acumen, all of that coming in from Mr. Vipul Shadir. Thank you so much for joining us today. And with that note, we'll take a short break. But coming up after the, all that glitter that we spoke about, we'll add some sweet to the show. The sugar industry also has laid down its expectations from the upcoming budget. A discussion with Sonjoy Mohanty on the other side. Welcome back. It's not just the jewellery industry that has a wish list for the government this budget. The sugar industry too is looking forward to a series of incentives from the government with focus on ethanol and renewables. Sugar manufacturers have been seeking a revision in minimum support prices as well as revenue sharing formula. They also want the government to introduce measures to shield prices from inflation. Meanwhile, ethanol makers are looking forward to a policy that would promote renewable energy through an ethanol blending program. They also wish for incentives to promote second-generation ethanol and flex-fuel hybrid vehicles and a lot of support on that. Joining me now to take all of these discussions forward is Sanjoy Mohanty, who is Director General at Indian Sugar Mills Association. Mr. Mohanty, hi, thank you for joining us. And what a year 2022 has been. I mean, it completely changed the way we looked at the sugar as an industry. Clearly, the government incentives, measures have been a lot of support as well. And the global and somehow the fundamentals that has worked for the industry too. I'll begin with asking you on how the 2022 year has been as a whole. Well, thank you, Manisha, for having me on the show. 2022 has been a watershed year. It's been remarkable. The highest ever production, the highest ever export at over 11 million tons, something that not only the industry but the world never expected, and the highest ever production of ethanol. We achieved a 10% blend in line with the Prime Minister's vision of achieving a 10% ethanol blend being delivered to the consumers of the country. So... 22 has been, like I said, a watershed year in the change that we will see from sugar industry just producing sugar to being a part of an energy hold for the government. And the government today, which is pushing very hard on climate change, requires renewables to be a part of this. And ethanol is playing this great role in nation building to help promote not only the Prime Minister's vision, but to be able to give the consumers and the, of the country a cleaner air to be able to breathe in. Oh, well, absolutely. And the first ever is not ending anytime soon, is it, Mr. Mohanty? Because the, for the first time ever at the Auto Expo, ISMA has a stall that starts from 11th of January. So uh, clearly, when it comes to biofuels, ethanol, flex hybrid vehicles, all of that really seems to be bringing the sugar industry on the fore. Absolutely right, Manisha. It's unimaginable that what is sugar doing in an auto expo? And let me just take a couple of minutes to give people a sense of what we are doing. Uh, ethanol is among the cleanest fuels that you can get. And as a biofuel which is made in India, produced in India, for India, you can't have a better form of energy security. So we've achieved the 10% and it was important for the consumers to know the role that ethanol is playing in nation building. We deliver the solution and the great part of ethanol is that it works on existing vehicles. You don't need to buy new vehicles. Number two, it works on existing infrastructure. So we are not putting up new infrastructure to deliver the ethanol across the country. Number three, the higher, larger amount of ethanol, more sugarcane being produced. We are augmenting farm incomes. So there's a clear benefit going all the way back. And let's not forget, all this is leading to saving in forex. A 10% blend saves the Indian uh, finance over 14 to 15,000 crores. So every percentage increase that we increase in our blend is adding to two important things, energy security and saving in forex, 
other than delivering a cleaner air into this whole country. Oh, well, absolutely. So, Mr. Mohanty, well, absolutely. Last one year has been, uh, as you say, uh, something of a watershed year for the industry here. I also want to start asking about the budget wish list that the industry may have. And I, I mean, I, I, I seek your advice whether I should start with sugar or ethanol on this one. But let's start on ethanol since we are on that topic. With so much happening, with the kind of investment that we're looking at, CAPEX, etc., what kind of subsidies, incentives has the government laid out for you? And what are you anticipating now from the budget? Well, at the outset, I must com compliment the government for not only being proactive, but being a huge enabler for the investment to come in. They put out the interest subvention scheme, which has made the difference. But let's not forget, our goals are not just ambitious, they are audacious. The ethanol 20% blend program was supposed to be done by 2030. And the Prime Minister has pulled that back to 2025. What does that mean? It means that we need to put up additional investment in creating capacity. We have the sugar to be able to uh, make ethanol, but we need additional capacity for juice to be turned into ethanol. And what does that mean? It just means that there is a particular investment that needs an IRR. And for that, all that we've been asking the government is that we need a small revision in the price of juice to ethanol. And the whole idea of the revision is to ensure the capacities get put up the capacities will end up delivering the objective the Prime Minister has put out of 20% blend and the fact that we can deliver a cleaner environment. So that's the first uh, you know, ask from the budget going forward, specifically on ethanol. Mm. And when it comes to sugar as an industry, the longest uh, ask clearly has been to increase the minimum support price for sugar sales. Is that still on cards? Absolutely, Vanisha. We as a sector have abided by the rules set out by the government and there is a CSEP formula which says that the FRP will go up and the MSP will go up. Uh, over the years, the FRP has been going up, but for the last three to four years, we have not seen any increase in the minimum support price. And that is something that's been a request because currently the sales of sugar actually are happening above the MSP. So just as a natural consequence, it's, it's just uh, it'll be great if the government can appreciate and take that price of MSP up. So you're right, it's a long-standing demand, and the reason is that the increase in MSP will only help to clear the farmer dues. There are no farm dues, you know, because they all are paid off well in, uh, you know, well in time. Just appreciate the fact that we pay the farm dues within 14 days of the cane being delivered, and the sugar is sold over 15 months. So that's a huge mismatch between working capital required. And that's what we seek from the budget is a revision in the MSP. Mm. You know, also, uh, while, of course, uh, coming back to ethanol and while uh, juice and molasses uh, is one part of it, the other clearly is about broken rice. And we do see smaller companies, smaller FMCG companies also try to make partake into this. How, how big a venture is that and how do you see that taking off? Sorry, are you asking about grain-based yes, uh, ethanol? Grain -based Is that ethanol. what you're saying? I missed that bit in the beginning. Well, it's wonderful that there are more sectors wanting to participate in this part of nation building. And we all can grow. The demand is humongous. And as we put up capacity, other grain-based manufacturers are putting up capacity. They're all working together to ensure that we deliver on the Prime Minister's goal. And the vision is doesn't will not stop at 20%. It'll go up to... 30 and finally like Brazil, we will also have E100 where a customer can drive up and say I want pure ethanol delivered into my car. So the opportunity, I mean if I just take a, a, a allude to insurance, the sector is so large that just not one player can you know, del, uh, deliver that. Same way, uh, this whole ethanol piece is so large, we are happy that we have grain participating and uh, to take, the, take care of any of the gaps that may arise. But as sugar sector we're not only committed, but clearly delivering the largest portion of the ethanol that's being produced and consumed. All right. And, you know, a graph is never straight. You have ups and downs. And the down when it comes to sugar and ethanol is the kind of water guzzler this uh, crop has continued to be called. And there's just so much debate going around on how one liter of ethanol, how much of water does it cost? What, how is the industry looking at that? You know, Manisha, this is one point 
I'm happy to have a debate uh, <laughs> with a small set of panelists. We all pick up a data point in isolation. Sugarcane is a 9-month or a 12-month or a 15-month crop depending on what's there on the ground. Whereas paddy or any other crop is typically a 3-month or a 4-month crop. When you take it and you compare like to like, which means you take 3 paddy or 3, uh, you know, weeds, any cycle and compare it to the cane, you'll suddenly discover that the water consumption is less. Forget about being a water guzzler. That's number one. Number two, uh, a lot of the cane growers are now shifting to drip irrigation. That's a huge plus. And why are they doing that? We as a sector, because we are zero, we consume everything and hence the whole concept of credits will come in and we will see how we can drive our community to gain more carbon credits by consuming less water. And last but not the least, it's very, very important to get facts right. And like I said, I'll be happy to do a panel discussion to show it's not a guzzler as it is being labeled as. All right. Happy to do that as well some other time. And I'll connect to you very soon on to this one. But thank you so much. No arrears, very strong sales, exports which have been at record highs and ethanol, a huge developing story there. So there's nothing that the sugar industry really seems to be lamenting about. But yes, there's a wish list even then from the budget this time around as always. Thank you, Mr. Monty, so much for joining us. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Commodity Champions. Thank you so much for watching.